Hello, I'm Marco Byrne, the Research Director of Goldcore, and it gives me great pleasure to be joined by Mr. John Butler of Amphora Capital today. Hi, John. Hi, Mark. Great to have you on that video interview today. So, John, just to give you a brief introduction to, uh, uh, to who John is, John is basically the former MD of Lehman Brothers and Deutsche Bank, and he had a speciality uh, with regards to asset allocation and asset allocation strategies pertaining particularly to gold and deep commodities. He went out on his own in 2009 and uh, basically began managing money uh, uh, on behalf of himself and his own clients, and he became a consultant to high net worth individuals. He also became one of the leading, uh, or became recognized as one of the leading experts in the gold market when he published this wonderful, wonderful book entitled The Golden Revolution. And if you haven't read it, it's an absolutely must read uh, book about gold and, and how gold may become uh, money and, and we may go back to a form of a, a gold standard in the coming months and years. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, I'm also delighted to announce that, uh, that the reason that we're having this interview today is that ourselves, Goldcore, and John and Four Capital are going to be working together. Uh, John is going to be working as a consultant to us in terms of the uh, relationship we have with high network, high network individuals and indeed uh, institutional clients. So, John, it's, it's great to have you on the call. And, and as I said, I'm a great admirer of your, your work and your research over, over the years. Thank you very much, Mark. Look forward to our discussion today. Absolutely, yeah. So let's get straight into it. Um, I, I, so the, the six key topics we want to cover today, uh, and the first one is the question of the moment, which is, are we at an inflection point? We're then going to look at goals outlook uh, in the coming months, uh, and more importantly, in the in the in the medium and long term, and uh, and the outlook out to 2020. We'll then look at uh, gold's value, as uh, most of the focus is continually on gold and its price, but uh, it's important to focus on, on, on gold's value and whether it is a form of money, whether it's a, a safe haven asset, whether it's a form of financial insurance. We'll then look at the, the, the risks of a possible coming global currency reset. Um, and then we'll look at asset allocation, which is probably one of the most important questions uh, uh, in terms of how much gold you should have in portfolio. And then finally, we'll have a, just a very brief section on uh, how to own gold. So yeah, John, let, let, let's get straight into it. Uh, a lot of chatter out there, whether gold has bottomed or not bottomed. Some people saying we may have bottomed in, in July. Uh, well, what's your own perspective? Well, certainly you've seen quite a dramatic uh, reversal in the the trend of gold in recent weeks. And if you look back at you know, sort of a multi-year chart, it does look like what's happening is quite significant. Now, I'm, I'm not a chartist myself. I'm not a technical guy in that regard. But I do respect charts. And the reason why is because a lot of people who trade gold or, or any, any liquid globally traded commodity or, or financial asset for that matter, Many of these people trade on shorter time horizons. They trade in you know, weekly or, or monthly sort of horizons under which you know, true underlying fundamentals tend to matter relatively less and pure sentiment matters relatively more. And, and so the fact is a lot of people simply trade the market this way. And so when you do get a trend reversal this clear in anything, you have to respect it for what it is. And, and I think that it indicates, at least in the near term, that the price of gold is more likely to continue rising than it is to suddenly reverse again and start falling. And so my my outlook for the gold price between, say, now and year end is that it probably would continue uh, to trend higher, if not quite perhaps at the reversal rate that we saw over the past few weeks. But then when you step away from the chart, when you step away from the technicals and you look at the fundamentals of the world, I mean, gold has had every reason to uh, get back into an uptrend recently. The Federal Reserve has blinked yet again, uh, showing us they're probably not going to raise interest rates uh, between now and the end of the year. And in fact, there has been a, a flurry of articles recently suggesting that perhaps even in the first part of next year, they're not going to raise interest rates. And you know, that's a bit of a surprise. And that has resulted in the dollar in general uh, weakening versus other currencies, not just versus gold. But gold, of course, is the currency, if you want to call it that, it is the money which offers an alternative to all the currencies in the world that are potentially uh, at risk of some sort of you know, devaluation as a result of 
zero interest rates, quantitative easing, and all of these efforts that central bankers and other economic officials are making to try and you know, generate some inflation. They say this is their policy goal. They want inflation higher because they believe that that will support growth. That's the you know, that's the Keynesian paradigm under which uh, most of the uh, economic and policy mainstream operates in this day and age. So, you know, there are many good fundamental reasons why gold should be finding its way back into an uptrend. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And uh, on both your analysis regards to technicals and also fundamentals. And uh, the technical side is the side that's been considered very weak in recent months and years because the trend was 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 down, and indeed even on a year-to-day basis, gold was down in dollar terms. And it's only in in recent, uh, well, it's actually just in the last day or two days that gold went positive in dollar terms. But it's only in recent weeks that we've seen uh, higher monthly closes, higher weekly closes, and just I think just to, uh, overnight we we had a higher uh, daily close above the 200-day moving average, uh, and. A few days ago, we had a higher daily close above the 100-day moving average. So I agree with you. I'm, I'm, we're not technical guys because that's more about short-term trading and momentum. But as you said, there's a huge amount of money in the world that is active by its very nature and all the hedge fund money in the world. And these guys are momentum-driven and they're very much trend-driven and trend-following. And it looks like, no guarantees, but the trend may be beginning to change. Um, what, what I would have considered we might have one last sell-off, particularly in October, because seasonally October can be a... A weaker month for gold if you look over the last 30 or 40 years but november and december are, are very strong months for gold and i think that's more so in recent years given the emergence of china uh, and chinese demand coming into the chinese new year yeah, right. so no guarantees but uh, yeah for the first time in a while i think the short-term outlook is, is, is looking good and, and as you said the fundamentals the primary thing which you alluded to is, is the fed and and we still have the cult of the central bank and the all-powerful central bank but, uh, you know, all the talk of increasing interest rates, that is beginning to fade. And, and, and what I think you have been suggesting for a long time, and many have been suggesting, is we may actually see negative interest rates as we see in Sweden and we see in other countries, uh, even from the Federal Reserve, you know. So the narrative there is beginning to change. And uh, I think that's that's hugely possible goal in the medium and long term. I, I think you would probably agree with that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the whole the whole idea that policymakers are even seriously considering a negative interest rate policy as something which is necessary would would help to support economic growth. I mean, the, the discussion itself <laughs> is telling you something about the outlook for gold, whether whether they ever implement it or not. The very fact that they're even considering it is a very strong indication that the global economy is not in good shape and that the policies that have been implemented, the unconventional policies that have been implemented over the entirety of the last business cycle haven't worked and in fact arguably have been have been counterproductive i mean it depends on your your uh, your economic perspective some some people argue that they have been counterproductive others don't regardless they certainly haven't delivered on their intended objectives in any meaningful way and this is true in japan it's true in the euro area it's true in the united states it's true in the united kingdom and and so on and so here we are. We've got through a whole business cycle with rates basically at zero. And, and, and now they're talking about negative rates. It, it's a very, very good indication that you need to be aware that the structural problems in the global economy are so severe, they may simply not have a policy-driven solution at all. And if they don't, then that certainly argues for a larger holding of gold in a portfolio of financial assets. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it just, I mean, it, the radical nature of negative interest rate policies, I, I don't think there's a beginning of discussion about it, you know, and, and it's very much saying this is the policy response that is necessary to stimulate growth. But there's no one saying, okay, as with all these policies, there's there's pros and cons, and, and no one's saying, well, what are the potential risks of, of this policy? And as we know, the potential risk is further uh, currency devaluations and currency debasement, and uh, and potentially, uh, you know, the imbalances that you just alluded in the system, the levels of debt in the world just keep getting higher and higher at every strata of society, and and and, and that's sort of the root cause of the the, the the initial crisis, and will be the root cause of, of any potential uh, subsequent financial crisis. Until we address that uh, that uh, root cause and, and, and gradually reduce these debt levels through whatever method is necessary, I mean, it might be writing off debts and, and, and things like that may, may need to be done. But it, it just to me, it's it's just 
you know, how they don't look at Japan and 0% interest rates and how it hasn't worked, and it doesn't give pause for thought, just, uh, it, 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 I, I just find it astounding, you know, but uh, it is a very bullish backdrop for gold, not just in the short term, but in the medium and long term, particularly if they go down that path, because where it leads to ultimately is is heading towards more financial repression and, and a, a quasi-cashless society is the next thing. If you start uh, charging people and high net worth individuals and institutions for uh, their deposits, you know, people are going to start looking at, at alternatives and gold will, will become more and more attractive. Absolutely. And, and I mean, it's important to put these things in perspective as well. I mean, gold has been now in a multi-year downtrend, right? The peak was in August 2011. We've been in the downtrend ever since. And we've come a long way. Um, and we've come a long way, though, in a context in which it was widely and generally assumed that all the unconventional monetary policy, the associated fiscal expansions you had in the United States uh, and Japan and the UK, you know, less so in the euro area, as we know. But it was just generally held that if you waited long enough, it would work. But now here we are. We have gone through this entire business cycle, and it has not worked. And therefore, you can re really call it an entire three-year, four-year downtrend in the price of gold. The whole downtrend comes into question, whether it was all really just misplaced optimism, kind of gradually growing, but nevertheless misplaced optimism. You had a falling gold price on the one hand. At times, the dollar was, all, was strong. At times, it was weak, but the gold price was generally falling on the one hand. And the stock markets, or risky asset markets generally around the world, we're generally rising. That is, investors at the margins, their risk preferences were to take a bit more incremental risk in financial assets and to hold a bit less insurance in the form of gold. So the gold price trended down as these risky financial assets in general trended up. I think that's over now. I think that's over. You know, the mirror image of the gold bear market was this equity bull market. And in the same way gold has reversed strongly to the upside uh, since July, well, guess what? You've seen the exact mirror image uh, in the risky asset markets. And so I think this is telling you a lot about where we've come. And if you just take it now as understood, as, as accepted, if you just embrace the reality that all this un unconventional policy ha has simply failed, it doesn't work, and they're really grasping at straws now, it's a very, very strong argument in favor of increasing uh, the value of your insurance policy, as it were, by accumulating more gold. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the the stock markets that you alluded to, I mean, it, it looks like they are breaking down. We, we can see uh, the debt crosses is one of the technical uh, indicators uh, when, when, when the stock markets are breaking down. And, uh, you know, men were at all-time record highs. They surpassed the record highs that we saw in the NASDAQ club in 2000, the, the record highs that we saw again in 2008, and you see it in the S&P 500, it's technically it's looking weaker and weaker, and uh, we know there's an inverse correlation. People don't realize uh, there's a lot of talk that gold is correlated with stocks. Um, particularly in the last year, two years, I've seen that argument uh, quite frequently in the mainstream media. And there, it, there is a degree of correlation, but that correlation is very much in the very, very short term. So when you get a sudden uh, sell-offs in stock markets and, and, and fears of weakness, as we saw, say, uh, in September 2008 and October 2008 with Lehman Brothers, gold can be correlated with stocks in the very short term because, you know, the, the guys we alluded to before, the hedge funds, uh, the prop desks of the banks, they just hit the sell button and everything, and they right. the cash to the U.S. Treasuries. So uh, so gold, as you said, it, stocks were going up, gold was going down, you didn't really need it. But that short-term trend is a short-term trend. When you look over the long term, there's a clear uh, inverse correlation. Um, and, and gold uh, performs well in the environment of st falling stock markets and underperforming stock markets. And who knows? You know, we, we, we give them the amount of uh, 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 currency debasement or as well as the amount of liquidity that's pumped into the system. Stock markets could have a just a small correction here and then they could keep galloping higher in the coming months and years. So uh, we, we oh, don't know. Uh, but, yeah, but, for, for sure. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing at all 
to stop the stock market going up in nominal terms, right? I mean, there are so many examples around the world, and you, know, you can look at Zimbabwe. You, know, you can look at <laughs> right. There's there's nothing to stop you know stock values or other risky asset values from going up in nominal terms. But naturally, if you do get back into a world in which the price level in general is rising, you know that will change investor psychology very very quickly, and those price rises will be seen for what they are. They will be seen as simply inflationary. And this will also, of course, shift the demand function for gold. What you've seen over the past few years, of course, is that you've seen asset price inflation, but because money velocity is so low, uh, you've seen essentially no or very little uh, consumer price inflation. And now, of course, commodity prices are crashing, which is helping to keep consumer price inflation very, very low in most of the world. And it's you know, turning into outright price deflation in some places. But the fact that asset inflation uh, occurred alongside, you know, more or less consumer price stability. That's an unusual and unsustainable mix. When you look at history, it doesn't really work that way. To the extent you do get asset prices rising in a stable price environment, rise at a much slower and steadier rate than the sort of double-digit returns that were generated over the past few years. I mean, that really does look like a bubble, and and more and more investors began to call it a bubble starting you know starting about a year ago and getting a bit louder about six months ago so to the extent that uh, risky asset prices stock prices are correcting now they are correcting from levels that looked pretty lofty whereas gold once again was kind of the mirror image of that and so we are now entering a transition period a period in which policymakers will seek new because this is how they think they can get out of the debt problem just by devaluing it in some way and they may not say so so explicitly but actually sometimes they dance pretty close around that and, and they come very close to saying explicitly you know we are out to devalue it's a great environment for gold I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad environment for for economic policy I think it's uh, I, I think that there's a lot of policy nonsense out there but, but the fact is, this is precisely the sort of environment where investors should be nervous, very well erode the real value of their portfolios. And you need to have, once again, some insurance in that portfolio, insurance against that devaluation policy set and mix, and that's gold. Yeah, yeah. And just can we speak briefly about we've looked at equities and you know potential overvaluation there and i think you can see it clearly in, in, in price earnings and all the rest particularly in the climate of economic growth appearing to be slowing down particularly in, in the global economy but even the u.s economy now is showing indications that it may be slowing down and we have price earnings ratios at quite lofty levels so that, that's on one side of the stock market but obviously the, the bond market is uh, looking quite lofty as well and we have record uh, valuations in, in in most of the uh, the sovereign bond market and, and indeed record low yields so uh, speak to us uh, about that in terms of the correlations with gold and, and what that means, or what you believe that means for the outlook for gold in the coming months and years. Well, I mean, the way in which unconventional monetary policy is supposed to work is that what you're trying to do is not only suppress short-term interest rates, but you're trying to also suppress long-term interest rates with the idea being that the relative valuation of the risky assets, the equities or high-yielding debt, for example, uh, that the investors will, their risk preferences will shift in favor of those kinds of assets because they are seeking, are seeking returns. And if you can't get those returns in either short or even long-term interest rates, well, then you have to move into these riskier asset markets. And so the bond market is expensive by design. Policymakers wanted to make the bond market expensive, and they found it very easy to do so by buying bonds. And they bought a lot of bonds. Now, that said, they have scaled back these policies over the past, well, not everywhere, but in the United States, for example, they have scaled back these policies over the past year. However, the net result is, of course, that the, the Fed's balance sheet is an order of magnitude larger today than it was back in 2008 and 2009. And so there is still you know, very much a backstop there supporting the Treasury market. And at least in the short term, it certainly appears to be a safe haven from the perspective of most typical investors. The problem is this, and it goes back to the devaluation topic we touched on a moment ago. When you devalue a currency, 
you devalue the bond market. Whether the, whether the interest rate ever moves or not is beside the point. If your currency devalues, if it devalues versus other currencies, if it devalues versus real assets such as gold, then for every 10% devaluation, your bonds lose 10% of their value. It may or may not affect the level of interest rate. It depends on the policy regime in which you're operating. And so, once again, this is where gold functions as insurance, not just against stock market weakness, but against bond market weakness. And in fact, when you get into an outright devaluation, as we also discussed, sure, stock prices might still go up, but they might not go up at all in real terms. They might go down in real terms. And by definition, the bond market goes down in real terms when there is a devaluation. And so when you look at history, and you do look at these correlations that we also uh, mentioned a moment ago, you know, sometimes gold is positively correlated with stocks and bonds. Sometimes it's negatively correlated with stocks and bonds. But when you get into real economic difficulty, such as in the 1930s, gold tends to be negatively correlated with the real value of financial assets. And when you get into prosperous times, gold tends to be you know, negatively correlated as well. It's when you're kind of in sort of this neither here nor there situation where investors aren't necessarily sure what's going to happen when there's no clear trend, that gold can from time to time have a, have a positive relationship with financial assets. But it's when you need diversification most, that's when you want the negatively correlated properties of gold. And this negative correlation is observed at times of crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you don't need gold, you don't need a safe haven. Sorry, when, when you have the crisis, is obviously we need gold. We haven't had a crisis in recent months and years. So it, 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 there's a narrative, oh, look, gold is in a safe haven because it's not going up in the last two or three years. But we haven't had a global crisis. There's been, you know, if you live in Greece, you live in Syria, you live in different countries around the world, there's been a national crisis. And those people have actually been protected by having an allocation of gold in the portfolio that they're high net worth individuals and, and institutions in those countries. Um, they, they've done very well because, exactly as you said, it was quite different to the likes of Syria and Ukraine. They were classic currency devaluations. But in Greece, it was more to do with financial repression and, and issues with the banks and capital controls and all the rest. And that's where gold came into its own you know, on that side of things. You, you alluded to the 1930s, and, 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 and I mean, that's a classic example of how gold was up 7% in one of the greatest deflationary periods of all time. Um, and the other classic example then is the 1970s, which is another time of extreme inflation. It, it was uh, stagflation, and uh, you know, gold massively outperformed all all assets uh, and I, I think stocks were in effect sideways for 10 years and, and lost massively in real terms while well, the Dow Jones 1000 in 1970 and 1000 1980 there thereabouts and bonds as well I mean we're talking about bonds uh, bonds obviously came off very sharply in the 1970s and interest rates went up very very highly so those are, uh, the, the, the narrative of rising interest rates is bearish for gold is uh, I think it's largely incorrect it can there can be correlations as you said in the short term all these things can be correlated but if you look over long terms, five, ten years, rising interest rates tend to be bullish for gold in the medium and long term. It's only towards the end of an interest rate tightening cycle, as we've seen in the 1970s, uh, when gold uh, interest rates have been going up for a long period of time. When people get a, a positive uh, rate of return again and you have uh, real interest rates are positive, that's when gold will become vulnerable. And I, I think we will both be able to view that that's a, that's a few years out from now. That's right. When thinking about interest rates, we have to think both in nominal and in real terms. Interest rates can rise a very large amount in nominal terms, but if they're not keeping up with inflation, that, that's still a bullish environment for gold fundamentally because it's real interest rates that should have a stronger relationship with gold. And if you, you know, get zero, if you get real interest rates down to zero or outright negative, as occurred during about half of the period on average in the 1970s, you know, that's very bullish for gold, and of course, gold eventually got into a hyperbolic uh, bull market at the very end of that decade and, and 1980. Eventually, though, real interest rates can rise to a level where it does become attractive to hold cash again. But of course, very large shifts in the demand function for money are, of course, associated with demand shifts in the demand function for, for gold as an alternative money. And this is what was happening in the late 1970s. You know, there was a fundamental shift in the international demand function for gold. You saw a decline in the dollar's share, uh, sorry, a demand, a decline in the demand function for the dollar. You saw a very large decline of the dollar's share of central bank reserves in the 1970s, for example. 
as central banks diversified into yen and they diversified into the Deutsche Mark. This is something that could also happen to get aggressive with a round of unconventional policy, quantitative easing, you know, who knows what it's going to be because the dollar share of reserves globally remains very, very large. So the dollar is at risk of a similar sort of shift in the demand function for dollars internationally as occurred during the late 1970s. And a, a demand function shift for gold would be the flip side of that. It would be the mirror image of that if and when that should occur. Hmm. Interesting point. Uh, make, makes sense. Um, so just, just uh, unfortunately, we're... we're, we're Press for time, so we're going to have to speed things up just a small bit. I think we've roughly covered gold, whether it's a money, it's an asset, a form of financial insurance. You know, at different times, as I suppose it's it, it's it comes into its own as different things. But uh, uh, but the bottom line is, it, it is an effective hedge against the various risks that are in the world today. And, and whether you see it as a currency or a form of money or financial insurance, I, I think, well, my perspective is 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 it also is all these things. I think you probably yes. share that perspective. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay. Very good. Just let's do it. We won't spend too much time on it, but the, the, the coming uh, currency reset, obviously your book, The Golden Revolution, was, was very much uh, sort of looked at that in great depth and, and really captured a lot of things are slowly coming to pass in terms of the what the Russian Central Bank, the Chinese Central Bank are doing, uh, divest themselves from US Treasuries, gradually allocating gold. Uh, a lot of the sort of big picture geopolitical themes you covered are slowly but surely coming to pass. Can you just speak to us briefly about that and, and, and I suppose what, what, where you think we are in that process? Well, this goes back to what we discussed a moment ago about the international demand function for the dollar shifting and that for gold, therefore, also shifting. The thing is this, is that because the dollar is the preeminent global reserve currency, the demand function for dollars can only shift so far before the world can no longer operate on this system with the dollar as the single preeminent global reserve currency. If that demand function shifts enough, then something else is going to have to step in to fill the gap. And in my book, I apply a game theory, you know, Nash equilibrium type of analysis to this development. And then I look at history, how it's also played out. And what you find is that there really is sort of a tipping point. We don't know where it is. But beyond a certain point, if enough countries, and it can start with small countries, it doesn't have to start with the big gorillas, you know, Russia, China, say, if even some small countries start to diversify their reserves out of dollars because they're concerned about the dollar's longer term store of value function, well, then that increases the pressure on the remaining players in this game to absorb that dollar demand. Because if they don't provide it, the dollar will begin to decline in value. So even as small players shift their strategies, that increases the pressure on large players to shift their strategies. And of course, as soon as a single large player shifts a strategy, that's going to shift the game for everybody. And these changes can occur very quickly. And that's why geopolitics can be interesting. Because the reality of the way the world operates today, with the dollar at the center of the international monetary system, the fact is the United States can use the dollar as a weapon. They, they can use it as a weapon to impose and enforce sanctions on Iran, for example, or on Russia. And of course, Iran and Russia don't necessarily like this. And, and now, of course, you, you see what's happening in Syria, where it appears Russia and Iran are outright collaborating uh, to assist the Syrian regime in the battle against ISIS. And uh, again, I don't want to play good guys, bad guys here. It, it, it's, it's not about that. It's about the reality of certain geopolitical associations or, or rivalries, on the other hand, potentially also contributing to a shift in the international demand function for dollars. But if that international demand function for dollars shifts such that there is less demand for dollars, and if you get to the point where the dollar therefore can no longer be the preeminent global reserve currency, you know, what's going to take its place? And, and this is where the Nash equilibrium is not you know, immediately obvious for those that don't have a sense of history. You think, oh, well, another currency replaces the dollar. So uh, well, China is the second largest global economy. It must be the Chinese yuan. But the problem there is, is that China doesn't have a fully mature, open, flexible payment system to offer the world. It might have it someday, but it certainly doesn't have it now. So the yuan cannot replace the dollar. What about the Japanese yen? Well, we all know, you know that the Japanese economy as a share of the global economy has shrunk in recent years, and it's, relative, it's just too small to supply global reserves. 
okay, uh, what about the euro? Well, obviously the euro area has its own issues. The fact is the world's become multipolar, and there is no one currency that has a legitimate claim anymore to be able to become the preeminent replacement for the dollar as the dollar loses this role. And therefore the solution is what it always was. That is, the solution to providing reserves in a multipolar world is for everyone to agree to use a non-national international money as the means to settle international trade uh, balance of payments. And that's gold. That is gold. So it may seem to be a barbarous relic uh, to some, actually ticks all the key boxes for a neutral international money for a multipolar world in which no one national currency has a fair claim to dominance. My book explores this in somewhat you know, greater detail, but this, I believe, is an absolutely key dynamic to understanding why the international demand function for gold is shifting, and it could shift much farther if history is any guide. And that multipolar world, and I suppose the degree of geopolitical risk that we see in the world today, I think most people accept that it's uh, you know, on a par with what was happening in the Cold War and potentially goes back as far as World War II. You know, the, the, basically the tensions between Russia uh, and, and the US and, and, and indeed China uh, seems to be quietly siding with Russia on this, which is, seems to be uh, not being picked up too, too, too widely and, and the ramifications of that, you know. There's also obviously China flexing their muscles in the Pacific and uh, these are big tectonic plates, you know, and uh, as you said, it's not, it's not, you know, it, black versus white, good guys versus bad guys. It's, you just need to look at it in terms of the real politic of what are the potential ramifications for, for us as investors and in terms of how do we allocate our portfolios uh, and protect against these various risks. So, so in the life of, the, of this multipolar world and these geopolitical risks, Presumably that speaks to, I mean, we're going to be speaking our own book to an extent here, but the traditional uh, asset allocation has always been 3 to 5%. Uh, presumably, given the, 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 the increase in these risks, there is a, a strong argument to have slightly, if not slightly, yeah, slightly more and, and, and higher allocations to, to low bullion in portfolios. Absolutely. Now, when you look at history, I think it's important to, um, to consider the monetary regime. And if you want to get an idea of what a robust portfolio looks like, a well-diversified portfolio, you kind of need to think about the regime you're in. Now, you've just mentioned the geopolitical uncertainties. It's very hard to model something like that. We know they're there. We absolutely know they're there. But what you can model is you can model the, the price volatility and correlation of gold within a portfolio of financial assets. And, and then you can sort of choose your regime. And clearly, we're operating today in a monetary regime that is flexible and accommodative. That is, whenever the economy is in trouble, monetary conditions are eased, sometimes very aggressively. And that is simply a different regime, for example, than the world had uh, throughout most of history, for that matter. But if you look at the history of the stock market, uh, if you look at the history of the bond market, you can take you know, Europe, you can take the United States. The fact is, is that for most of the available history, Currencies were still linked to gold in some way, and that link was only really broken from 1973, when a proper free-floating exchange rate system finally came into existence. And so, you know, that's the regime we're in. And if you look at how gold has behaved in price, volatility, and correlation terms with stocks and bonds since that time, and you solve for what an efficient portfolio looks like, actually your base holding of gold shouldn't be only 5%. It should be more like 15 to 20%. I mean, that's, no, that's an order of magnitude higher. And it's also higher than most portfolio managers really are aware of because they just sort of assume that, you know, gold is no longer or should no longer be a core holding within a portfolio of financial assets. But if you then layer on the geopolitical uncertainties, if you layer on the fact that the bond market uh, has, offers these yields, which are barely at the level of consumer price inflation, if you consider the possibility of negative interest rates, if you consider the possibility of bail-ins, um, you, know, you layer all these things on top of you know, 15 and 20 percent, before you know it, you can easily justify an allocation to gold today of 25 percent, maybe even more. A conservative portfolio, you would think has a lot of bonds and cash in it and not much in the way of stocks. But if you look at the bond market today, it's not a market. 
not not in the sense that we think of it as that way. And as we and, and cash rates are zero. So you put all of these things together, and I think a conservative portfolio can easily justify a 25% allocation to gold. And for that matter, if you have an outright view on gold, or you think it's outright going up and you want to take a view, then of course that 25% is simply the, the, the benchmark. That's your starting point. So you, we're in an environment today where for historical reasons, for benchmarking reasons, portfolio diversification reasons, and then the very real risks we face, investors should consider holding more gold today than they have at any time in their investing life cycle up to this point. It's a strong thing to say, I know, but I believe you really can justify this and ground this in historical data, in a bit of monetary uh, financial theory, and then of course incorporating the current global context, which is one in, in which many risks, unfortunately, um, do appear to be increasingly in evidence. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Makes, uh, I mean, absolute sense. I think instinctually a lot of our clients felt that to be the case, and we would have clients who would go above. Our, our standard advice was always the, the 5 to 10% uh, allocation, and there's a huge body of academic research showing that the 5% allocation is, is has worked you know, over long periods of time. A lot of the data goes back to 1986, uh, and I think you've looked at data going back longer than that, you know, which I, I think will come into, into the 1920s, post World yeah. War One. Yeah, so I look forward to going into that in more detail with you in in, in the upcoming webinar that we're going to have next week. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's I mean it's fascinating, and, I, and instinctually people will go, "Wow, 20, 25 percent. That's very, very high." And, Absolutely, it is high, but it's high for a reason, and, and there is all the very strong reasons that you've outlined there why you would have this higher allocation. But even if you went to these very high allocations, you would still have less of an allocation to gold than you would to equities and bonds. And yet there are quite significant risks in the, both the, the stock markets and the bond markets of today, as we've already alluded to. You know, So I think it's a, it's a radical argument you're making. It's a quasi gold bug argument and and, 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 and and you know the gold bugs will, will love it but I, you know I think it, it's it's not a doom and gloom end of the world scenario this is just rational portfolio theory that's right that, that's absolutely right it is simply taking rational portfolio management diversification and incorporating history layering over a little bit of monetary theory and considering the environment in which we're operating today you can make a very rational argument for these substantial holdings of gold in a portfolio. You don't have to believe in doomsday. You don't have to believe that the, that any global monetary transition is going to be particularly disorderly. You just have to look at the numbers that history has offered up as they are. And you can easily justify this unusually large allocation to gold at the present time. Absolutely. Okay, John, unfortunately, I could talk to you all day, but uh, the clock is against us. So I want to thank you. I found it very interesting. I think that the viewers will have found it very interesting and hopefully they got a few insights there uh, fr from the, the, the various information that you imparted. Um, and I think yeah, it's information that will help both high net worth individuals and institutions in terms of how they look at goals uh, in terms of asset allocation. So to conclude, uh, yeah, just want to give people a, a heads up that John will be appearing at the Precious Metals Symposium in Sydney. The date is actually coming up quite soon now. It's on October 26th and 27th. Uh, and we are scheduling meetings with uh, uh, clients for John while he is in Sydney. If you're interested in that, contact us at sales at goldcore.com and we can organize uh, meetings with John while he's down there um, to discuss the gold market and, and basically optimal strategies and as well as asset allocation, which is John's John's great forte. Um, and yeah, well also we're going to have a webinar next week, and you will see the link uh, at, at the bottom of the email here in terms of registering for email. And we've given you sort of a flavour of of, of of what uh, uh, we will be talking about on the webinar. But what, what we found in recent years is that there are so many questions that people have since gold is so poorly co covered uh, in, in many respects in terms of uh, good, good research. So we're going to have a QA, and a which is all, always hugely popular with people, and we'll be bringing people on the webinar, and they can ask uh, questions directly of John. And uh, So, yeah, sign up for the webinar at the bottom of the page, and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, John. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. So how do we do? Good job.